When AUKUS was first announced in 2021, the spotlight fell on its nuclear submarines, a symbol of deep trust and strategic deterrence. But beneath that shadow, a quieter transformation is underway. Pillar 2, the program focusing on advanced weapons, sensors, and data systems, is rapidly becoming the true engine of technological cooperation between the United Kingdom and Australia. It is here, in the fusion of smart weapons and digital networks, that the long-term balance of power in the Indo-Pacific may ultimately be decided. Pillar 2 is about creating a smart lethality network. Instead of relying solely on a few expensive platforms, the UK-Australia axis is building layers of distributed precision systems, guided missiles, resilient data links, and AI-enabled control nodes. The goal is to ensure that every platform, from a helicopter or a patrol craft to a coastal launcher, can become a node in a shared, connected strike web. In a region where distance, weather, and sheer geography punish traditional naval tactics, this approach is revolutionary. At the core of this cooperation lies the partnership between Britain's Defence Science and Technology Laboratory, DSTL, and Australia's Defence Science and Technology Group, DSTG. Their recent agreement on joint R&D for guided weapons marks the most concrete expression of Pillar 2 yet. The UK brings decades of missile experience through MBDA, its world-class test ranges, and a mature defense industry capable of integrating cutting-edge seekers and data links. Australia contributes unique testing environments, manufacturing potential, and a vast maritime domain that demands adaptable, low-maintenance weapons. Together, they form a complementary pair. One offers design precision, the other operational realism. Technically, the focus is on four pillars. First, seekers and sensors, the eyes of modern munitions, are being developed to perform in complex literal conditions using multi-spectral infrared and radio frequency systems, capable of identifying and tracking small, fast targets near cluttered coastlines. Second, data links that can survive electronic interference are being refined for real-time target updates. The ability to adjust missile trajectories mid-flight turns a single shot into a networked asset. Third, AI-driven mission software is emerging as the brain of the system, enabling sensor fusion, swarm management, and dynamic target prioritization. And finally, modularity, the ability to swap seekers, warheads, or propulsion units across designs, reduces R&D cycles and allows shared production between British and Australian factories. Sea Venom, the lightweight anti-ship missile now entering Royal Navy service, is a perfect prototype for this logic. Compact, networked, and adaptable, it demonstrates how small missiles can deliver strategic impact through connectivity rather than size. Within a few years, Australia could field similar systems on its MH-60R helicopters or coastal batteries forming a bridge between short-range Hellfire-class munitions and heavy long-range strike missiles like the NSM. The shared development of such weapons under Pillar 2 allows both nations to evolve doctrine around distributed lethality, the idea that numerous cheaper, connected launchers can impose the same deterrence as a few expensive warships. For the UK, this collaboration extends its industrial footprint beyond Europe. After Brexit, London has sought tangible partnerships that reflect global Britain, projecting influence not only through diplomacy, but through technology exports and joint capability building. 
For Australia, the benefit is sovereignty. Access to the knowledge, tooling, and design practices needed to sustain an independent defense industry. The new Redback and Huntsman production lines in Geelong are the physical manifestation of this shift. As Canberra invests billions into AUKUS programs, localizing even part of the manufacturing cycle for guided weapons could transform its economic and strategic posture. Yet the implications go further than factories. Pillar 2 aims to turn the entire AUKUS framework into an agile network of shared innovation. Imagine a scenario where a British-developed seeker algorithm is calibrated in Australian tropical conditions, assembled locally, and tested during joint exercises like Talisman Sabre. Data collected from those tests flows back to the UK, improving AI targeting models for the next software iteration that cyclical feedback loop, design, deploy, learn, iterate, is what will keep the Alliance competitive in a future of autonomous and electronic warfare. Still, the challenges are serious. Export controls, intellectual property restrictions, and differing industrial policies could slow cooperation. Australian firms have already expressed frustration over limited access to AUKUS supply chains. Politically, both governments must manage expectations and demonstrate that the partnership benefits domestic workers as much as it strengthens deterrence abroad. Technically, networked systems are vulnerable. Jamming, cyber attacks, and electronic deception can degrade data links or spoof sensors. And strategically, adversaries from China to other regional actors are already adapting by investing in countermeasures like directed energy defenses, decoys, and electronic warfare suites. These obstacles, however, are precisely why Pillar 2 exists. Its goal is not just to build new weapons, but to develop resilient innovation ecosystems that can outpace the adaptation cycle of competitors. The UK-Australia axis recognizes that the next major conflict may not hinge on who fires first, but on who can reconfigure technology fastest in the field. Pillar 2 is designed for that kind of warfare, modular, digital, rapidly updatable. In the near term, the partnership should prioritize three concrete goals. First, establish I joint test beds in both countries, a permanent framework for experimentation and shared data on guidance systems and sensor performance. Second, create common data link standards, allowing different allied weapons to communicate across fleets. Third, phase in industrial localization. Assemble subsystems in Australia, while Britain focuses on design and high-end integration. This dual-track approach strengthens supply security and political legitimacy at home. The broader strategic payoff is that both nations become less dependent on U.S. technology while remaining firmly interoperable with it. Pillar 2 therefore acts as a bridge, keeping AUKUS relevant regardless of political changes in Washington. By spreading the technological base across two trusted allies, it ensures continuity even if one partner faces domestic turbulence. Ultimately, Pillar 2 is not about one missile or one project. It represents a doctrinal shift from platform-centric warfare to network-centric warfare, from industrial secrecy to controlled technological sharing, from static deterrence to adaptive deterrence. The submarines of AUKUS may carry the headlines, but the software, sensors, and guided weapons of Pillar 2 will define how those submarines fight and how the UK and Australia shape the Indo-Pacific battle space in the decades to come. In essence, 
Pillar 2 is where AUKUS becomes alive, a living network of laboratories, factories, and data links stretching from Salisbury Plain to South Australia. If London and Canberra can sustain momentum, this smart weapons network will not just complement the nuclear deterrent, it will give the Alliance the agility to deter, adapt, and prevail in an era of constant technological contest. <laughs>